what trauma does to us. It puts us in that like fight or freeze state to where, you know, you kind of do either one of the three and without even realizing it, like that's who you become if you're not, I guess, apt enough to check it and apt enough to, to be more in tune with yourself to know that, okay, I am different. These things look different. I'm acting different. I need to try to figure out what's going on so that I can, you know, just kind of be better and be healthier and maintain. Hey, mamas, welcome to the More Than a Mother podcast, where we believe you can pursue your dreams and be a great mother at the same time. I am your host, LaJuan Moses, and I am helping you find the freedom to live. Are you ready? Let's go. Hey friends, welcome back to the More Than a Mother podcast. This is your host, LaJuan Moses, and I'm back with you again for another great episode. If this is your first time listening at More Than a Mother podcast, we are helping moms to create a life outside of motherhood without sacrificing their family time. We believe that moms can pursue their dreams and be great moms at the same time. My guest today is Ms. Dominique Battle. She is a life transformation strategist, as well as a mental health and couples therapist. Dominique has taken what she's learned and implemented from life experiences and what she's been trained in regarding mental health and system-based treatment to build a successful consulting business centered around helping you live your best life. In case you didn't know, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. So Dominique and I sat down and talked about motherhood, mental wellness, trauma, and just what exactly to do when we are experiencing those rough and difficult moments in life. Let's dive in. Hey, Dominique, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you doing? I am wonderful. Welcome to the More Than a Mother show. I am so happy to have you here with me today. Thank you for having me. I'm so appreciative. I appreciate it. So more than a mother, we believe that you can be a great mom and pursue your dreams at the same time. However, we all have a path that we travel, something that's happened to us, our transformational life story that kind of put us on the path that we're on today. None of us all of a sudden wake up and we have life all figured out and know the things that we want to do or just out here living our best lives. We all have a path to travel. So with that being said, could you share what your aha moment or the moments that have um, inspired you to be on the path that you're on today? Well, an aha moment that I guess I can, I can speak about is just having my son and, and becoming a mom. I became a mom at 20, got pregnant at 19. So right into going um, into my sophomore year in undergrad is when I found out I was pregnant. And for that, life kind of changed for me because, you know, I was in college, so I was a regular college student. I was going to parties and I was going to classes still and, you know, life was just different. And then I was faced with this very real, very apparent adulthood that I had to kind of figure out and manage at such a young age. And so that's when life got real and I had to, I had to really pay attention more intentionally with, you know, schooling and what I actually wanted to do there, pay attention to um, the life that I was living, the friends that I had and things like that. So for me, that was my aha that, okay, I'm an adult now. I'm a whole adult now. I have a, you know, this human that I'm about to have that I have to take care of. And so I have to be more responsible so that I can, you know, be the best mom that I can be. Right. And I can relate to that because being a senior graduating high school, that's when I got pregnant with my son. So I can definitely mm-hmm. relate to that story of where you're just carefree, no responsibilities at all. Right, like, right. Like, I'm responsible <laughs> for a whole human being right now. And it, right. <laughs> and it makes you just start questioning your life decisions. And I mean, really growing up faster than your peers and things of that nature. So, I mean, it does make you start to look at life differently. So what kind of obstacles did you encounter when you were going through this? So I had my son early. He was due in March, but he came in December. So he was three pounds and 2.7 ounces when he was born. And so he had to spend about a month and a half in the NICU, which is a neonatal um, intensive care unit um, in the hospital. And so in my 20 year old brain at the time, I said, okay, well, I can go to school 
stay pregnant while I'm in school, have the baby, and then jump right back into my studies, take care of my son, and do it that way. Right. But he wanted to come early. He was ready to meet the world, and that didn't necessarily go with the plans that I had for, you know, still wanting to attend school. So I was pretty much living at the hospital at that point. So I was up there every day. Um, I would try to take time to study, but what I didn't realize at that time, which which made it more difficult for me during that period, is that it was a huge trauma that I was dealing with, and I was trying to manage not only becoming a mom and figuring out what that looks like at 20, but now I have this preemie that I really don't know how to care for. Nobody in my family can tell me how to care for it because they've never had a preemie, so now I feel more alone than I did before, and I'm still trying to focus on school, but I'm still in my sophomore year. I'm trying to figure out you know, what I'm going to do for money. How are we going to take care of ourselves? I, his dad was with me at the time. So, you know, he was there, but it was still a lot at one time. And so that obstacle, just trying to figure out how to get through that, not knowing if he was going to live, because there were, were a couple of times where he stopped breathing and he wouldn't eat. So he couldn't intake any food. And so it was a lot of back and forth during that period that just really made me question my worth as a as a mom like because I was 20 I already didn't know what I was going to do and now this big huge obstacle came which just further discouraged me as far as me not really knowing how to take care of this person that I've been responsible to take care of so that obstacle um and managing that like throughout that first year was very very difficult I mean really forced me to have to realign how my life looked because not only do I just have a child at home I have a premature baby and that takes a lot more care and a lot more time and attention than I had originally planned that I was going to have to give. Right. Because, I mean, you get pregnant. Nobody expects to have, like, the difficulties or have a premature baby. Oh. So you kind of have <laughs> the best laid plans, and then life happens. So exactly, it really throws it all off track. And, I mean, I can't imagine being 20 years old and you have a preemie. As you mm-hmm. said, it's a trauma that occurred. I mean, you may not have recognized it at the time, but it definitely right. was a trauma. Definitely, definitely, because he was so small and he had tubes going in his nose and in his stomach and, you know, he didn't cry when he first came out. And so that was a that was a trauma for me. So it took a while for them to get him to cry. So all of these different steps that I wasn't paying attention to really hit me once I got home and he was still at the hospital. And so being able to, or I guess being forced in a way to have to put all of that to the side because I still have to go and make sure he's okay, go and, you know, touch him if I can, and, and make sure he still gets the things that he needs, even though he was in this, in this incubator, and so it was all those little things that I think sometimes, not even in this situation, but other situations that people may not pay attention to, all the little itty-bitty traumas that happen, that, you know, they can really take hold and take effect, like once you get somewhere and sit still, and everything starts to come crashing down. Right. And yes, that trauma, I mean, that's a big piece. And I would love to just go into talking about that right now. Because I mean, in the Mm -hmm. work that I do outside of business owner podcast, I work with domestic violence victims. So I do a lot with being trauma informed and trauma informed care and teach a lot of different classes, helping other advocates to recognize trauma and those type of things. And I think it's just important to point out how trauma impacts so many areas of our lives. So when you had those little pieces that were coming together and you started to recognize it as trauma, like how did you start to work through that process? Um, I did see uh, a counselor that was on campus. I went to see her once my son came home because I realized how how different I was as a person. Um, I realized that I wasn't, I was almost operating on autopilot. You know, like my, my body had got gone into this freeze state. And so I had to figure out a way to be able, because I couldn't, I didn't feel like I could connect with, with anything or anybody. I just had to do, I had to make sure, you know, he was fed and had to make sure bills were paid, but it was difficult for me to connect. And, and, you know, that's what trauma does to us. It puts us in that like fight or freeze state to where, you know, you kind of do either one of the three and without even realizing it, like that's who you become if you're not. I guess, apt enough to check it and apt enough to to be more in tune with yourself to know that, okay, I am different. These things look different. I'm acting different. I need to try to figure out what's going on so that I can, you know, just kind of be better and be healthier and maintain. So I did start seeing a college counselor on campus that really helped me to just figure out, in addition to the fact that I know having a preemie had changed my life, 
there were so many other factors that I had not considered because that was so huge and that it was a big umbrella over everything else. She helped me to really understand that I need to be able to manage my life a little bit better, not have balance, but just be in a space where I can do all the things that I need to do in a way that still serves me and serves my household and serves my my child in the way that it's supposed to. And so that was a big eye opener for me, you know, being able to hear that from her and, and to know that it was okay that I was going through these things. Because sometimes I think people feel like it's not okay to experience the feelings that come with trauma or to experience the things that they've have that has happened in their lives. But she she almost gave me permission to feel and permission to to struggle a little bit as I figured it out and permission to just not know, not know what to do and to be okay with learning what that looks like for yourself. And so that was helpful. Isn't it amazing how we kind of need that permission because we think that as right. well. <laughs> That we're just supposed to have the answers all the time but it's just amazing how something so simple as someone saying it's okay to feel the way you do it's okay for things to be this way like that permission is just the things that we don't think about like why should we need permission to feel right. <laughs> for this but it's just amazing how we just operate like you said on autopilot because mm-hmm. we're busy we're just shoving emotions and shoving experiences and just piling them in the dirt as well, like bury them down. But then Mm -hmm. it comes to a point when all of it comes to a head because you cannot bury trauma or experiences. And no matter how you try to run away from them, like you really, you can't get away from them. Mm -mm, mm -mm. It sticks. It sticks to the body and it will always come up. If it's not dealt with, it does not go anywhere. Right. So it needs to be dealt with. Right. So I know we jumped, straight in with talking about trauma but I think and I think it's because both of us deal in trauma so we're just kind of naturally having this conversation (laughs) let's back it up just a little bit for our listeners as to what exactly is trauma because when people hear that word they think that it has to be something so extreme so bad but can you just break down like what exactly is trauma yeah. So, you know, we're, we're all individuals and we, we see the world differently and we perceive it in a different way based on our experiences. And so trauma doesn't look the same for every single person, you know, that, that we may encounter. It looks different. So for some people, it can be, you know, whether or not their mom verbally abused them. For others, it could be that catastrophic, you know, type of trauma where, you know, they may have been involved in domestic violence or they may have been, you know, sexually abused. So it's it's events that happen in your life that have such a compounding effect that it it changes your personhood and it changes the way that you see the world. It changes the way that you interact in that world. And it keeps it's something that keeps you in this hypervigilance state to where you're always on guard. You're always in survival mode. Everything that comes to you, whether it's positive or negative, is taken as an offense and your body kind of immediately tenses up and you feel like you need to protect. Because for whatever reason, at some point in your life, whatever the trauma was for you, you didn't feel protected. And so it's, it's knowing what that looks like. And for each person, it's different. Each person has different symptomology when it comes to it. And each person defines their trauma differently. Nobody else can define that for you. Right. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's just something huge. And, and, and it's an experience. And, and we call it the traumatic experience because it truly changes who you are is something that can truly change the makeup of your being. Right. And it can ultimately consume you if you don't find ways to go to counseling and kind of get that proper help and deal with it. So we're kind of getting there, but let's talk about, cause you're a mental health professional. So we're kind of getting to that. So can you just tell me more about what you're doing in mental health? Yeah, of course. So I work primarily, I love working with women who are in the midst of major life transitions. So those who may be going through a divorce, those who may be struggling with domestic violence, whether it's post-relationship or currently in it, those who are new moms, because sometimes that can be a difficult experience for some. It's not always a joyful experience, depending on the situation. Um, Those who are going through breakups. So any of those major life transitions that, that we have. I love working with women in these particular areas because I think that that space, you know, is, is a beautiful space to be in because it you, you find so much growth in it and you find so much, I don't know, expansion of yourself and of your being and of your soul in that space. Right. And so I tend to work with those women primarily, but I always also work with couples who are struggling with um, infidelity issues, communication issues, those couples who are 
um, dual career couples where both parents are working and both parents are out of the home. So sometimes it's hard for them to figure out how to manage work and manage home and manage being parents as well as managing, you know, two people who are in the marriage together. And so I help them kind of find the sweet spots in between that so that they can have a healthier place, you know, in, in their home. So I work with um, those particular types of people in my therapy practice. As far as consulting, I consider myself to be a transformation strategist. And so I love working with individuals who need help getting over those emo emotional barriers, who have those traumatic experiences in their lives. And they may have already sought counseling and had a lot of help in, in dealing with the symptoms that come with trauma. But now they're trying to figure out how to get from this post-traumatic phase where they receive the help and they know the coping mechanisms to now trying to venture out into the world that looks new to them now to get to a better place and achieve their goals and things like that. So that's why I tend to operate. That's my sweet spot. That's what I love. <laughs> and I mean, that's such an important spot to be in because I think, especially in the African-American community, we don't talk about mental health enough. And you know. we don't see a lot of people that look like us practicing in mental health. And it's like this taboo that we are not supposed to have mental health issues or <laughs> right. get any type of help for it. So, I mean, that is such an important and great sweet spot to be in. Because I think that the more people that show up and start to look like us, that it's like, okay, this is okay. And mm -hmm. I don't know where it came from, what <laughs> it's built upon, but it's just, it's such a stigma that needs to be broken down. So, I mean, that's important work that you're doing. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I work with a lot of African-American people. I mean, I have some people that are of different races in my practices, but most of them are African-American. And so every time they call, I absolutely love it because the strength that it takes to, to go against the grain as a society, as a culture, and just as people to just get the strength to make the phone call, I think is always huge. And so I, I love it every time they call. Every time they call. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And I mean, I think the more conversations like this that happen, the more people feel empowered that it's okay to go out and seek help because we all need help at one point in time. And we shouldn't be expected to have to figure it all out on our own. I agree. I agree. It goes back to that not knowing that you need to ask permission until you actually do. And it's like, oh, I can just do this. I can just go to therapy and it's okay. <laughs> So, you know, our audience, we have a lot of mothers that listen, and we do have other people that listen as well, but this is more than a mother. So when it comes to motherhood and mental health, like, I know that you work with all type of people, but what kind of things have you experienced in working with mothers or any suggestions you can offer for moms that may struggle with, like, mental health and things of that nature or may not even understand what mental health is? Right, right. If you are enjoying this podcast, please take a few seconds and leave a review, a rating, and share this with all of your mom friends. We want to get the word out about the More Than a Mother podcast so that we can empower as many moms as possible. This is truly a movement for all moms. As moms, we are a community and it is up to us to continue to lift each other up. So don't keep all this greatness to yourself. Subscribe, like, share, rate, and leave a review so that all moms can start to tune in and start living out their own unique life stories. So some of the women that I have worked with that are new moms, for example, they came in because they were struggling with postpartum depression. And so it's helping them to kind of get through those phases and understand what that is. So, you know, we have the normal baby blues for some, for some moms where, you know, it's just difficult trying to understand how to take care of a child when they first get home. They're crying and they're not sleeping. And so just being sad and exhausted and tired in that space is one thing. But when it kind of goes past the baby blues into depression where, you know, you may be having thoughts of hurting your child or you may be having thoughts of just not wanting to be there because it's, it's, it's too bad. I, I work with a lot of those women in my practice. For moms who are struggling with teenagers, I have a 14 year old and he's a son. And so the struggle is real, <laughs> yeah. very, very real. And so they, they have a hard time connecting. And one of the pieces um, when it comes to teenagers that I think resonate well with a lot of teenage moms is that there there is this period where, for me at least, where the, my son kind of got to a place where he was 11, 10, 11 years old. And so I was like, okay, I've been doing this thing for 10, 11 years. I got this down, like we're good, we got a flow. And then 12 and 13 happens and it's like, 
who are you? Like you're, you're a completely different person. Right. I feel like I'm having to parent you more now than I did when you were younger. And so that, that phase of shifting into how do I parent this teenager differently than I parented this kid because they are two different people. And I want to make sure that I'm doing it in a healthy way to where I'm not damaging them, that I am being respectful of their generation and who he is in his generation and not forcing my own beliefs or traditions and things like that on him so that it, it, it creates a more healthier environment. So working with teenage moms in, in those particular areas are another another thing that I, that I do in my practice and that I love to do. Tips can vary. It just depends on the, the age of the child and, the, and what the struggles may be, if there may be mental health issues there. But one of the main things I think as moms that I know I forget and a lot of moms that I work with forget, and I'm assuming it's for most, is that we focus so much on being a mom and being, you know, awesome at that and making sure that we're taking care of our kids that we kind of neglect ourselves in the process. And it's just one major thing is just to understand that as a mom, you're a woman first and everything in the household kind of flows from you. So if you're not full and if you're not taking care of yourself and if you're not being reflective, it's not selfish to do that. It's more so I need to protect my house and I need to take care of my house and my kids. So in order to do that, I have to take care of me so I can take care of everybody else. So, you know, I always tell all of my moms to, you know, try to squeeze in any kind of self-care time that you can. And it doesn't have to be the elaborate self-care where you have to make time to go and get a mani and pedi, or you have to make time to go and get a massage. Those things are great, you know, if you have the time to do it. But I know for the moms who have younger kids, it's a very precious commodity and they may not have, you know, an abundance of it when it comes to that kind of stuff. So, you know, redefining what self-care may look like and figuring out whatever that is. If it's 30 minutes, just laying on the bed, looking at the ceiling. And if that's all you need for that day to get through, then that is your self-care and that's what you need to do. So redefining what that looks like, taking care of yourself first, knowing that it's not selfish because mom guilt happens. Mom guilt is real. Yeah, it's okay. But just understanding that it's not selfish for you to take care of yourself because everything else falls from you. And so you have to be okay. And that is so true. And I, all those things that you say, I preach on here all the time that you <laughs> before you are a mother. So that is right on point. Yes. What are your thoughts on self-care as it pertains to mental health? Do you feel that self-care is an important component of taking care of your mental health? Yes, I think it's a huge component of taking care of your mental health because a a lot of the symptoms that come along with mental health is from a lack of taking care of yourself. So, you know, for the people who are starting to isolate or who stay in the bed or, you know, who can't really wrap their minds around the negative thoughts that happen, it's because we are so lacking in support or lacking in help or lacking in all these other areas that just to be able to get still and get reflective and take care of yourself and learn what you need to do for some people. I mean, some people have the more severe mental illnesses and and that's a chemical imbalance. So that's different. But if we're just speaking on the topic of like mental wellness and self-care and things like that, then it's extremely important because you have to be okay. And so as we, you know, walk into our worlds and walk into life, we are always two parts of a whole. We're the person that we are now and we're also the person that we want to be. And so self-care is somewhere in the middle of that. It's learning how to bridge that and to create a balance to where you don't feel misaligned throughout your day. Because whenever you are misaligned or whenever your environment isn't conducive to who you want to be, then it creates all these different symptoms and it can create all these different issues. So having moments in your week or having moments in your day where you are able to just be with you, to be self-reflective, to do whatever it is you need to do, kind of brings you back to that middle ground and that balance so that you can be clear whenever you go to work or take care of your kids so that you can feel, I don't want to say happier because I think that's a, so that you can feel more joyful in your spirit and more peaceful when you're encountering all these things that come with kids and come with the house and come with everything else because you have to be able to be peaceful in the midst of that chaos and self-care helps you to maintain and build a foundation of that peace so that when the chaos comes, it doesn't completely rock you and you don't completely fall down. Like you can take it. You may, you know, stumble a little bit when it comes, but you don't fall all the way down. And so that's how important it is, I think, when it comes to your mental health. Right. And you touched on an important part where you were saying people having to be okay with being with themselves. Mm -hmm. And it seems like just from my observation that people aren't comfortable with being with themselves. No. But no, have you encountered yeah. like 
what has been your experience with that? Because I mean, I know you can tell people be with yourself and you get to a certain point where you're like, okay, I'm fine with being with myself, but it probably wasn't <laughs> always that case. So, I mean, what can right. we talk about? What can we say about learning to be with yourself? When it comes to learning to be with you, and I think this pandemic has really created this kind of forced stillness where you're, you're forced, you know, you may have lost your job, God forbid, or you may have, you know, done something where, you know, you, you're working at home, you're either not working or you're at home all the time where you have to focus on you. You have an abundance of time to focus on you. And a lot more people now are realizing that it's not so pretty when I'm just sitting here with me and my thoughts. So one of the things that I've learned in my experiences and one of the things that I try to tell, I tell my kid, I tell my clients, is that you have to learn how to sit in a bad day. Because a lot of times people have bad days or they have bad moments and they're in a rush to fix it or they're in a rush to get out of it, that it, they don't learn the lessons that they need to within that. And learning how to sit in a bad day helps you to get comfortable with the thoughts that you have. Because our thoughts can be nasty. Our thoughts are our worst critic. It will tell us all sorts of lies and all sorts of things that are not accurate. And so if you learn to first identify and understand what those thoughts are, not judge them, not be mad at them, not, you know, be negative towards them, but just see what they are, identify them, understand what thoughts come to you whenever you sit, because that will let you know everything you need to know about why it may be difficult for you to manage your life and manage all the responsibilities, why it may be difficult for you to interact with your kids or interact with your husband, like all that stuff is there. We don't have to seek outside of ourselves to find it. We just have to get still enough and be brave enough to sit with ourselves, sit with those ugly pieces that we all have and make friends with it. Because only then when you can make peace that this is also a part of me, that you can learn to figure out where you have the control and to control that part. Right. And that that's great advice to sit in a bad day. I mean, I've never heard anybody put it that way, but there you're right that it's just this such kind of like microwave generation where we just want everything mm-hmm fixed right away right but what you find is if you're operating in that way you're as you said you're not learning the lessons you're not resolving finding that peace because you're just piling things on top of it or buying things to kind of make yourself feel better but this pandemic as you said has forced people to stop and if you were trying to run from yourself before you can't run from yourself now because you can't go anywhere so (laughs) right that's and that's great to just (laughs) work Right. You just can't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. It is great to learn to sit and just accept it. And as someone has said before, just allow yourself to feel those feelings because once you start to feel Mm -hmm. it and you are accepting it and acknowledging it, then that's when you can really kind of experience that freedom from it. Exactly. Exactly. And it becomes, it becomes not as bad as we're thinking or not as bad as we're making it out to be. Once we can just sit in the bad day and realize that we're still alive hopefully nobody died like it's just it's just a bad day that's it it's a bad moment tomorrow is always on time it's never late so it will come the day will end it will be over you have a chance to do it again right so as a mom in this time how are you managing everything in life oh so (laughs) a loaded question yes Yes. When the, you know, the pandemic hit and the kids were out of school and, you know, my son started virtual school, I realized how much appreciation I did not give to his teachers because this is not something that I would choose to do. So that first week or so was, was very difficult, very, very hard to, to manage it. Um, but my son is a little bit older, so he, he's more independent to, to be able to manage some of the things on his own and then I can kind of guide and help and be a resource and things like that. But it's been difficult. It's been very difficult because I have, I have a lot more telehealth sessions than I did before. And so I'm home, but I'm not really home. Like I'm still working. And so having or helping, you know, my son and my family understand that, that I, you, you see me here, but I'm not as available as I may look because I'm still sitting here working has been one of the one of the hardest, I think, I think things for me to kind of make peace with. And that's where, you know, I myself take my own, my own advice and try to learn how to sit in this moment and figure out why I feel guilty because I'm not as available, why it's a struggle for me to make peace with it. 
And because I don't want to overcompensate. I don't want to have all this time at home where I'm doing all these telehealth sessions. And then I get off and I'm, you know, buying my son all the Xbox games that he wants because I've been working at home all day. So I'm trying to make sure that I keep that balance. Sometimes it's difficult. And so I do a lot of, I'm always self-reflecting. I'm always sitting down and and figuring out what I feel, why I feel it, where it came from, what can I control in this situation? What can't I control in the situation? Because if I can't control it, I'm not going to worry about it right now because I don't want to choose my struggles. I just want to deal with the struggles that I have. And just, it's helped me to be, I'm always reflective, but it's it's helped me to be more intentionally reflective, being able to choose what I want to reflect on, what's the most important thing for me to focus on and not feel guilty for not focusing on the rest. Yeah. And that, and that's an important mindset to have. And a lot of people don't take the time to pause and do that self-reflection. And as Mm -hmm. I said, now's a great time to pause and kind of start to remember those things, reflect on things. And even if it's at the end of a day, just kind of reflect on what you've done, how things Mm -hmm. went and, if it's something that you want to change, work on changing it tomorrow. Cause I mean, that guilt can creep up and will creep up and we will feel bad for taking this time to do like a podcast interview or whatever it is, because we feel that we should have paid right. attention in other areas. But I think moms and women in general, we are just too hard on ourselves. But I mean, that self-reflection does help put it in perspective. Yes. Yes. 100%. It helps to maintain that balance. Right. And I like how you said that you have a lot of telehealth sessions because that's encouraging that people are reaching out during this time because I was having a conversation with my daughter yesterday and we were talking Mm -hmm. about just like the good times, the memories that are make that we're making and how we're making the most of it. But I had to remind her that everyone's situation isn't like this. So we're blessed during this time where we are still working we're having the family time, but a lot of people don't live like this. So the fact that you have people reaching out to you to seek help and get that assistance, that is just powerful. Yes, I agree. I agree. And and I expected my numbers to go down because I was like, well, people, you know, they're dealing with life right now. They don't have time for, you know, this. But my numbers actually went up. I had more calls come in and more people willing to do the telehealth because they For a lot of people, they realize that, you know, it's difficult for them to sit with themselves. They don't like not having anything to do. Or for a lot of couples, they realize that I love my husband and, you know, I want to be with my husband, but I don't like him, you know, 24 hours a day every day. And and that's created some, you know, some conflict in the home. (laughs) I am sure. I mean, but that's great. I mean, just letting people know that telehealth during this time is an option. So you may not be able to get to your therapist. You may not be able to get to a counselor, but know that people like Dominique and other professionals exist and they can help you over the phone because that is a thing and you don't have to sit alone and suffer. You can seek help even during this time. So if you're in a place where you feel like you need some help, you need mm-hmm. someone to talk to, then we're definitely going to link to Dominique's information. Or, or if you have someone in your area, we're just encouraging you today to take care of yourself, take care of your mental yeah. well-being, and reach out for some help to just help you navigate these emotions and things you're experiencing during such a time as this or really any time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I completely agree. It's so important. So what would you say has been the most rewarding part of your life journey so far? I would say seeing my son and seeing, seeing the person that he's become, because there was countless times, you know, in his upbringing where, you know, we question as moms, whether or not we're doing the right thing or we're making the right decisions, or if I had one too many bad mommy days and not enough good mommy days. And so that has, it continues to be, I'm sure it'll be an ongoing thing. That was something that um, I really, really worried about because I was so new and I didn't have I had my parents and, you know, family and friends. I have my village who is absolutely amazing, but nobody had had a preemie and nobody, I was the first with all of my friends to have a kid. So nobody could really support in, in that way. So a lot of it was just me trying to figure it out and figure out what that looks like. And so I was so worried that he would just turn out horrible. <laughs> I was so worried. I don't, and I don't know why, but I was worried that, you know, just the worst would happen and seeing, you know, who he is now and, you know, he's so caring and he's so loving and, you know, he's a teenager. So of course that comes with his own set of challenges, mm-hmm. but un- underneath, under that, or what underscores all of that is he's, he's so mature for his age and he's, he's so well balanced to be, you know, a teenager. And so I, I look at him 
And I think that is my greatest reward that knowing that number one, he's still breathing. Like I, you know, I did that much. I kept him breathing, but more so that, you know, I had a hand in it. It's not all on me, but I definitely had a hand in making sure that this person that's going to go out into the world and this person that's going to be somebody's husband and somebody's dad and somebody's employee, they're going to get some, you know, pretty good, decent human being. And so that's, I think, the the most rewarding for me. And it continues to be the most rewarding for me. Great job, mama. Kudos <laughs> to you. And that is definitely, you. <laughs> definitely a rewarding feeling because we don't know what's going to happen when we're raising our little people and they start to grow up. <laughs> no one ever knows what's going to happen. And we just hope that we do the best we do. So that's a very that's it. <laughs> Thank you. So what would be a tip or tips that you could just offer to a mom who's struggling right now to manage it all? Um, to get still and get reflective. <laughs> that That is always my tip. That is always, in, in my experience, in my experience in working with other females and other women, is the most effective. Because it's one thing to be able to put things in place, like the self-care and, and the planners and the to-do list and all these things that we, you know, feel will help our lives. And, not, and all of them do. But to, we always reach those periods that get chaotic and then all of that goes out the window. Whereas if we started from the beginning with the foundation to just get reflective, figure out what it is you need to do. Don't just throw things, don't throw the bandaid on it. Figure out what it is, get reflective, understand that process. And so as you continue on your journey in life and as a mother, when you hit those roadblocks, you won't fall all the way back at the bottom of the ladder. You may fall down a step or two, Mm -hmm. but you won't fall all the way back down because you have that cushion of being reflective and you have that cushion of knowing how to how to dig more into yourself to get to the root, to the root cause of what it is. And I offer this um, resource on my website. It's a journey to thrive kind of self-reflection guide. And it has some really, really powerful, important questions that if you were to sit down and and you kind of set the environment, set the tone to be by yourself and ask yourself these hard questions answer these hard questions because it's only for you, you kind of start to notice the feelings that show up and you kind of start to notice the thoughts that come up. Or, you know, if you're thinking about a particular person, what thinking about that person evokes in you, whether it evokes irritation, whether your face turns up when you think about them, or, you know, if you get joy and you get happiness, because that tells you what the energies around you are are doing to your spirit. Because if you do that by yourself while you're writing about it or thinking about it, I can't imagine, you know, what that's like when that person or that thing is right there in front of you and all of those emotions and all of that stuff sticks and we carry it home. We, you know, take that within ourselves, regardless of whether or not we know it. And it comes out in different areas. It comes out in frustration. It comes out in stress. It comes out in fear. So being able to sit down and ask yourself those hard questions, figure out what that looks like, and then doing the work to to create the environment that you want, I think will have the most long lasting effects when it comes to learning how to manage it and, and, and deal with all that stuff. Sit still and get reflective. I like that. And Mm -hmm. journey to thrive. That sounds like such an amazing reflection journey to take. So we'll definitely link to that in the show notes so that everyone can grab a copy and start their own self-reflection journey. So it was so great having you here with me today, Dominique. Thank you so much. You're welcome. If you could just tell our audience where we can find you online. Definitely. My website is www.dominiquebattle.com. Um, and from that website, you can see links to my therapy practices, especially if you're in the state of Florida. Um, on the social media, I am Dominique Battle underscore on all of them on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. And so you can find me on there. Feel free to reach out and ask questions. I have no problem answering questions. Um, If you're looking for therapy and you're not in the state of Florida, then I can definitely help you figure out where to go to find somebody that's in your local area. Wonderful. So thank you again for that information. I'll provide those links in the show notes. It was so great having you here today. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, head over to LawanMoses.com. I love for us to stay in touch. Make sure you leave your email address so I can send you inspiration, tips, and the latest updates. Or if you prefer, text the word more, that's M-O-R-E to 302-440-4632. 
We have some great things coming up and I don't want you to miss a thing. Thanks again. Make sure you subscribe and leave a review. Until next time, keep pressing because victory is yours.